My name is Chris Jr. I've been an ethical hacker slash penetration tester for four years. We'll be discussing what penetration testing slash ethical hacking is in this video. As you can see, pen testing is a high income skill that's definitely worth learning. We'll be going over ethical considerations, types of hackers, types of pen tests. We'll also be going over common vulnerabilities, pen testing methodology, some of the most common pen testing tools, and a couple other things. Let's get into it. So first of all, what even is a pen test? A pen test, also known as a penetration test, is basically when a pen tester will do a simulated attack on a system, or another way to put that is they attempt to hack a system. Then they write a report about all the ways they were able to hack the network or the system that the pen test was performed on and give it to the relevant stakeholders, such as the development team or the leadership that requested the pen test. A pen test is similar to a vulnerability scan However, vulnerability scans just scan for vulnerabilities and that's kind of the end of it. Whereas a penetration test, they are actually trying to exploit the vulnerabilities and see what an actual attacker could access. When you're a pen tester, you get to pretend to be a bad guy, hack into stuff, write reports, and you're not even responsible to fix things in most cases, just breaking them. There are some ethical considerations when doing legal pen testing. First of all, you always wanna make sure there is written permission because you can go to jail if there was poor documentation or you do something on the pen test that you weren't supposed to do. Second, you have to respect privacy. You, you can uncover some pretty crazy things during pen testing and you always wanna keep it a secret. Sometimes it's company proprietary information. Sometimes you'll find a whole bunch of customer data and you know, there's really an infinite amount of things that you can find. So make sure that you're exercising caution when you're looking at this information, not storing it anywhere where anyone else can see it, leaking it out to the internet, etc. Privacy is extremely important. A lot of companies might make you sign an NDA before you get testing. Now, besides the purely ethical hackers that get paid to hack things, what other kind of hackers are there? So first of all, there's the ethical hacker, which might be called a white hat hacker in the older terminology. And this basically just means that you do not operate outside the law whatsoever. They use their skills to identify and exploit vulnerability in only legal ways and they generally make reports to give to the stakeholders so they can fix the vulnerabilities. White hat hackers motivation usually stems from monetary gain via their job. Their main purpose is to prevent breaches from actual attackers. The next popular term is an unethical hacker aka black hat again in the older terminology. Black hat or unethical hackers use their skill for strictly illegal activities, for example, hacking into a bank account, stealing someone's money. Their motivations are usually financial. Another example is a black hat organization might ransomware a hospital demanding ransom to unlock their network. So the next genre of hackers are gray hat hackers. They basically kind of stand in between black hat and white hat hackers. So for example, they might illegally hack into a system let's say a bank, but instead of stealing money, they're actually writing a report and submitting it to the bank. So technically they weren't supposed to hack into it, but they didn't do anything malicious and even reported something and helped everybody. These people's motives don't generally come from a financial standpoint. Usually it's just the thrill of hacking into something that maybe you weren't supposed to. So the next group we're talking about are hackers called hacktivists. These people are motivated by political or social causes. They usually use their skills to attack companies, government, organizations, or maybe even like a charity that they don't agree with. Then there's the state-sponsored hackers, also known as Advanced Persistent Threats, APTs. But just a side note, not every APT has to be a state-sponsored actor, but most state-sponsored actors are APTs. But anyways, state-sponsored actors, these are people that are employed by the government to usually do cyber war on other governments. But they aren't just hacking governments, they could be hacking companies and the infrastructure of their enemy country. Their motivation usually lies in getting a leg up above the other country that they're potentially in cyber war with. This could be monetary gain, military gain, just really anything. And then lastly and least, there are the script kitties. These are people that are just running tools that they found on the internet. They have no real knowledge about the underlying technology going behind it. And a lot of times they might not even know what the tool is exactly doing, but they're just running these security tools on the internet. Uh, maybe reading some documentation, maybe not, and just like hacking things in a really newbie, inefficient way. So now that we've talked about the types of hackers, let's talk about the types of penetration tests. 
And just to note, these aren't all of the possible tests. These are just the great bulk of them that you're going to find when you're out in the industry. So the first test we're talking about is an external pen test. This test is for testing all of the hosts that your company owns that's facing the internet. For example, if you can go into your web browser and get to your website, that means that your website is on the actual internet and that is included in the external pen test. External pen tests do not cover what's inside of your organization's network. It is strictly everything on the outside. This usually includes web applications, VPN gateways, maybe there's some external like FTP service you use for your clients so they can send and receive data securely from that. And you know, it could be a number of other things, but again, external means that you're testing everything that is on the internet. So now we'll move on to the second type of test, which is internal testing. Internal testing is when you are only focusing on what's internal to your organization's network. So for example, that web application that we were talking about that's exposed to the internet, is probably not going to be in scope for the internal test unless if it's also a part of the internal infrastructure. But internal network tests are usually focused on DC controllers, internal services, internal web applications such as payroll, and really anything else you can think of like SSH, FTP, the DHCP server, Kerber roasting. So again, internal testing is just everything inside of the internal network. So the third kind of pen test we're talking about is mobile app pen testing, which is exactly what it sounds. These tests usually comprise of iOS and Android applications. You could be doing anything as reverse engineering the application, checking out how the application talks to the internet, such as APIs, looking for hard-coded secrets, and more. The fourth kind of test we're talking about is thick client application testing. It's very similar to mobile application testing, except this, we're gonna be focusing on desktop applications. This can be things such as Discord, Slack, Zoom, anything that has an application that you can download to your computer. The fifth test we're gonna be talking about is web app testing, and this is for any web application or website. A web application pen test doesn't have to be only external or only internal. The sixth test we're going to be talking about is API pen testing. APIs are actually incorporated in mobile applications, desktop applications, web applications, and a whole bunch of other things. I want to say about 90% of web traffic in today's world is actually API traffic. So while you're performing a lot of these other tests, you're actually going to be testing an API already. But for API pen testing, you're actually specifically focusing on the API itself. The seventh type of test is a social engineering slash phishing campaign. So phishing is basically when you're sending emails to people trying to convince them to click on links and give you your credentials. Same with any type of social engineering. You're basically trying to trick someone into giving you something that you're not supposed to have. That is an actual type of pen test. Last but not least, we have a few different types of pen tests that apply to everything we just talked about so far. So the first thing you have is a black box pen test, which basically means that you know nothing about the system you're about to test. You might not even have an IP address yet, and you have to figure it all out as you go and act as a true attacker that has absolutely no information. Second is a white box pen test. This means that you have every IP address you're supposed to test. You know what the system is, what it does. You know exactly how to go from this system to that system. Maybe you even have documentation about the environment, the network, and all the systems inside of it. Basically, a white box test is you just know everything you can know about the environment, the box, and all of that good stuff. And then you have gray box testing, which is a mix of white and black box testing. You have some information, but maybe you don't have all of it. For example, maybe you have an IP address of the DC controller, but they didn't give you much more information besides that. So now that we've talked about the types of hackers and types of pen tests, let's go ahead and go over some common vulnerabilities. And a lot of these you might even be asked on an interview, so pay attention. And just a note, we're only lightly going to touch on these vulnerabilities. If you want to learn more, I'm going to be making a video about all of the ones I talked about here that go in-depth and have hands-on examples. So go ahead and subscribe and go see if I posted those yet. So the first one we're gonna talk about is SQL injection. Even people that aren't hackers know about this one. It's one of the most popular examples. SQL injection happens when an attacker manipulates an SQL query to steal information from a database. And when I say steal information from the database, we're talking about emails, usernames, passwords, IP addresses, we're talking about, and many other things. They can also inject new information into the database, corrupt the database. This sounds cool and all, but in today's time, SQL injections aren't as common as they once were, unfortunately. 
So without going into too much detail right here, we'll look at this example. Long story short, this attacker typed up a bad username that you can submit into a create an account form, which will then change the administrator password to something that he controls all by breaking the SQL query by carefully crafting a payload. So the next vulnerability username. we're gonna talk about is cross-site scripting. It's also known as XSS. XSS allows an attacker to execute malicious scripts in a victim's browser, which can hijack user sessions, deface websites, or redirect users to malicious sites. Here's a classic cross-site scripting example. The attacker in this situation is adding a script tag to the URL at the top and then having their victim click it. And when they click the URL, the evil JavaScript hosted on evil-user.net run in their browser, which can send an attacker their password, their sensitive data, wire transfer money the to them, The next vulnerability more. we're gonna talk about is cross-site request forgery. This is where an attacker tricks a victim in performing an action that they were not intending to do. For example, what if there was a link you could send someone that automatically transferred funds from their bank account to you all with a click? If we look at this example, you can see at the end of the URL, it is setting the email parameter, which in this case, the attacker changed to their evil email and sent it to the victim. When the victim clicked on the link, the email was changed to the attacker's email, and now the attacker the controls the account. The next one I wanted account. to discuss is SSRF, also known as server-side request forgery. SSF is when an attacker tricks a web server to performing a request on an internal system or another external system. In this example, an attacker is sending a request to a website and he tricks the website to make further requests into the network that it's a part of, allowing an attacker to use that website as a proxy to look into other internal systems. If it can only access external systems and not other internal systems, it's still You definitely SSRF. need to research more about vulnerabilities. We're not gonna do that here in depth. Again, I'm gonna post other videos, but some things you should be looking at right now are the OWASP top 10 vulnerability list and the OWASP top 10 API vulnerability list. I'll link them both below, but please make sure you go look at them, read them, and research them. Lastly, we're gonna be talking about the phases of a penetration test. So the first phase is reconnaissance. During this phase, you're gonna be collecting as much information as possible about the systems you're about to be testing or the organization. Recon can also include things such as finding out if the employees have passwords leaked on the internet of the organization you're testing, looking at social media for hints about their tech stack or how the culture is at that company in regards to security, finding other subdomains, and a plethora of other things. That takes us to the second stage of penetration testing, which is scanning. You're actively scanning network ranges to find active hosts, scanning hosts to find active ports, and scanning ports to find services. But don't worry, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Basically, in this phase, you're just scanning stuff, figuring out exactly what you can attack. So, so just to kind of quickly sum it up, there's port scanning, vulnerability scanning, and network scanning. Brings us to the third phase of the penetration test, which is exploitation. This is where the penetration tester actually tries to exploit the vulnerabilities and gain access to a system. The aim here is to determine whether or not an unauthorized hacker can gain access into your system and cause harm to the company. The next phase is post-exploitation. Once they actually exploited a vulnerability and got to a system, now they're gonna try to elevate their privileges and get to an admin account where they can even do more stuff. They also might be doing things such as persistent so they can maintain their access into the system. This also includes seeing what information they have access to now based on their user account. And just as a little side note, this is where a lot of red team engagement start at the post-exploitation phase. At this stage, you're performing actions an actual hacker and APT would be doing after they gained access to your machine. That brings us to the last stage of penetration testing, which is the reporting phase. This is a crucial step and it involves creating a detailed report, discussing the methodology taken, documenting every single thing you found, and describing everything appropriately depending on who's going to be reading your report. You definitely wanna offer very specific recommendations during this step help the organization fix their vulnerabilities. Now let's go ahead and talk about some common pen testing tools that pretty much every pen tester uses on the daily or they at least know about it. 
The first one's Nmap. Nmap is primarily used for host discovery and security auditing. It can find which hosts are available on a network and then scan for ports and tell you what services are running on those ports so then you can go out and look for vulnerabilities. Then there's Wireshark. Wireshark is a network protocol analyzer and it can sit on a network and watch for traffic and analyze exactly what traffic's going where and to and all of the details regarding that. Then we have Burp Suite, which is the best web application testing tool you can possibly have. We're not gonna go too in depth right here, but I eventually will come out with a very in-depth Burp Suite video where we go over all the functionality. But for right now, just know it is the best tool to test web applications, and you can also use it to test APIs. And since we're on the topic of APIs, we can mention Postman, which is a tool for testing APIs. Next up, we have Nessus. Nessus is a vulnerability scanner that can also test which hosts on the network are available or not. It automates the process for scanning vulnerabilities, creates super detailed reports, and has a lot of really cool functionality. You can scan for network vulnerabilities, web application vulnerabilities, all kinds of stuff. Next up is Metasploit. Metasploit is a pen testing framework. It can do vulnerability scanning. It can do network discovery. It can brute force SSH, RDP. It can do a lot of stuff. It has a ton of exploits built into it. So if you're ever doing your OSCP or on a real pen test, you might already have an exploit for the exact thing you're looking into built into this tool. That pretty much wraps up what we were talking about here today. Go ahead and leave a like if you learned something new. And subscribe because I'll be posting a lot of in-depth hacking videos soon and all sorts of awesome stuff. Until next time.